hello, uh, Matt and Desiree. Um, Matt, do you think this is a serious issue or, or these potential crises are ser serious issues? And what do you think people can do about it in facing them? Sorry, what specific crises? Well, the potential that basically we could have overlapping crises of post-Brexit, the, the ones outlined in the article are, are right. for instance, the post-Brexit food chains being broken and, and um, uh, the shock to the economy from COVID, uh, potentially an influenza pandemic and also uh, uh, and something we experienced in the north and also in the southwest, floods and so forth as well. There's potential for all of those things to occur simultaneously and they're quite reasonably you know there's quite high potential of them you know yeah i mean it's a massive worry i think <clears throat> it's hard to really understand what what the significance of the all those different crises because they we don't get a a, a picture of reality through the media so for example with the brexit with brexit obviously it's going to be a big rupture but there has been years of it being used as a political football by both sides um the sort of the remainder side has always said there's going to be this huge catastrophe at all the at every different point along the Brexit um uh uh since the vote and it hasn't happened yet but of course it might happen and then of course with coronavirus um we don't know the long-term impacts I mean we'll probably be living with this for generations and then of course on top of that is climate change which is the biggest problem of all and actually I think it's quite interesting the cor cor coronavirus hopefully one good thing that will come out of coronavirus was is it will change consciousness about climate change because I think climate change has always seemed this abstract thing that's going to happen in the future that it's very hard to organize around in a sort of immediate way because people can't conceptualize it as something that's going to affect them in the in the near term and coronavirus is kind of one of the first aside from economic shocks but coronavirus is one of the first disasters that has really hit everyone's life across class across every sort of uh, boundary in society so people don't feel they're insulated from crises in a way they probably did before coronavirus so i'm hoping that, that shock to the system that coronavirus has, has has given to the UK, but not just the UK, obviously the whole world, will really change consciousness and make people aware that even though we can't see it, well, we can see it in certain places, but we can't see it in an immediate sense here, it's coming and we need to prepare for it and we need to do something now because if we wait and it hits in the way that coronavirus is here, um, it's going to be a, a thousand times more of a crisis because it's one we can't just easily find a vaccine to or reverse. It's going to be here, here with us forever and could be the next extinction. So, um, yes, it's it's a major worry. But hopefully one good thing is consciousness has changed during this crisis and we can use that uh, to try and bring about some policies which might avert crises in the future. Excellent. Well, I'd like to bring in Desiree here actually as well and say, I, I think it would be fair to say, though, even though it coronavirus has affected everyone, it's affected certain communities significantly more. And um, and that disparity, do you think that prepares us for these coming crises or do you think we've got huge amounts of work to do? Oh, we need to turn you off mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, we've still got a huge amount of work to do. I think the, the rhetoric around the virus and one of the things that's been the most disingenuous, the most misleading, is the message that we're all in this together and we really are um and as we can see from the stats and from the fact that people so many people of color have been impacted by uh, the virus and i've you know myself and family and friends we've been to so many funerals and people who aren't touched by it don't see it as anything otherwise it wouldn't be spreading as much as it is is and as much as it has been so I think that's there's a huge amount of work to do. And just thinking about what Hillary said earlier on, which I, I very much enjoyed as well, but um, about maybe somehow we are now thinking about how we get our food, where we get our food from, and more, more thinking about it than we would do before the virus. Like I've had reports of people talking about mutual aid still being racist. People couldn't get the food that they wanted. People promised to do some shopping and that they would help out an, a, an elderly West Indian person or an elderly African person and they wouldn't do it and they turned up at the door and then turned back around and we don't it's like it, uh, Covid presents us this multi-layered issue that just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going we haven't even touched the bottom yet. Mm -hmm. Well bring you back in there Hillary uh, and everyone I'd just like to get some final thoughts from you guys on what's been said here because 
it seems to me that we face a lot of potential crises, both this sort of almost seemingly longer term one in climate change, which is affecting and killing people right now, but it's something that maybe we have some time to to deal with a little bit. And then these ones coming around the corner. Um, and that whilst there is some potential for new things to happen, we don't seem to be, as a society, maybe ready to deal with with those crises. Would that be a fair assessment, Hillary? Or do you think there's more cause for hope than uh, than pessimism? I think it it depends on us very consciously learning the lessons. I agree with Matt that um, I mean some people have put it in terms of this is a dress rehearsal for um, for climate change, and it is kind of leading people to be more aware of um, threats that come from human um, destruction of the environment. Because I mean, the, the, this pandemic is a result of um, the exploitation of, of food, of food chains and the link and animals and, and so on in China. But I mean, not particularly China per se, but globally. Um, but so I think there has to be a conscious learning. And one example, um, I mean, it can be a conscious use of the crisis, if you like. You know, what's that word? Ingenuity breeds creativity. So uh, I, I looked, I talked to some and wrote about some workers in the Airbus industry, in, in a company called Airbus, in, in the, um, you know, the aircraft making industry, who were facing, you know, redundancies and layoffs because of the, the collapse of the, um, you know, plane travel of of of, um, of aviation, and um, they were got involved in actually producing ventilators, and and it was actually the unions that consciously organised to make that happen, and I think that that is an example of where if the particularly the unions, but putting pressure on on employers could learn that lesson and in the face now of the massive redundancies that are going to take place in in the um, aviation industry and after all we don't want to be you know reconstructing the um aviation industry in quite the same way i mean you know one one thing that could be done is the development of of, of train systems in europe so we never had to fly to europe it is it is completely irresponsible really to to, to to fly you know such small distances when we could get a train perfectly well and very enjoyably um but there could be a whole sort of re-equipping of the health service using the skills and capacities of of workers in the in in the in the aircraft industry uh similarly a lot of the wind power equipment um renewables equipment more generally could be made by companies like rolls royce and and Airbus and, and so on. And so, and I think, you know, talking to workers in Rolls Royce who who now are now thinking in this kind of direction and the experience of, of being involved in the production of ventilators gave them the, you know, help towards developing the idea that production systems could be different and thinking critically about what they're producing. Uh, and in the face of redundancy, thinking, well, you know, we're not redundant, our skills could be useful but mm. making something different. So I think whether or not there is this learning of lessons depends on our, our organizations and our ability to, to um, develop conscious strategies for uh, preparing for climate change in the way that Matt outlines. Yeah, and um, Desiree, one of the things that occurs to me when Hillary's talking about unions and, and preparing organizations is um, this very key term, essential worker. And I think it's been a really interesting way to talk about the working class and the people who actually make society work. They are essential. I think COVID reveals that. But we're very quickly seeing from both yeah. the government and society at large that we can forget about a lot of those workers you know there has been pay rises for health staff yeah. minimal ones they're actually still below 2010 levels um, yeah but then you're looking at social care staff majority workers who are immigrants or people of color you're talking yeah. about I, I think one of the key networks we've talked about it a little bit here is food networks the supermarket networks the ways that we get our food are absolutely essential and again low-wage workers um it, predominantly again people of colored working class uh, at, at 
you know and in, women yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and and so do you do you think there's possibilities for unions or where do you see changes that come on behalf of essential workers because clearly changes need to be made in support of them we've only got an aging population we're only still going to have more crises we need to support them yeah i think um one of the things that kind of for me anyway intersects all these different issues is race and gender and how much more women of color are affected by these crises including the climate crisis, including the devastating um, climate um, disasters that happen mostly to the global south, that we here are very lucky to escape, but we know that it's not going to stay that way. And I think that unless we try and think about it in terms of what where these oppressions intersect, then just kind of complaining about one thing without thinking about another thing isn't really going to get us that far. And we will still kind of maybe lack um, a, a forward thinking um, approach to working these problems out. Okay, excellent. And I'll just bring in Matt, I'm about to introduce your piece, Matt, but before I do, do you have any final thoughts on the piece that we've just discussed here and, and some of these solutions and some of the problems that we're facing? Um, because Declassified UK specifically looks at foreign policy especially, and I think, you know, as, you, uh, as has been mentioned, there's, there's many crises that are going to face, people of the rest of the world are going to face far worse, probably because of British foreign policy. Yeah, I mean, I can make it. I'll make a general comment on the the, the sort of crisis narrative. Or, uh, I mean, firstly, I think the world's the world's in crisis perennially. Like three million children die of malnutrition a year. That's a crisis. Uh, Yemen, two million children have been on the edge of famine for years. That's a crisis. We, what's presented as crises is political in itself. But I think what we need to understand is no crises is an obstacle to change to progressive change in fact it can be an opportunity you know the idea of naomi klein about disaster capitalism we could have disaster socialism it just depends about what the balance of forces are in any place if we had a corbyn government now brexit could be an amazing opportunity for progressive change because you could lose all the reactionary stuff from europe and and, and keep all the progressive stuff and then add, add in your own so I, I think we need to look at each issue as, as a political problem. And our political system is in crisis because it's not it, it's not democratic. It doesn't represent people. It represents corporations and it represents uh, small interest groups. If we could change that, all these crises would be we could we could solve or at least move towards solving them quite quickly, I believe. So I think that the left and progressives need to understand that this idea of an external crisis, which is out of our hands is can be useful to reactionary forces because it gives them a uh, it, it lets them off uh, and I mean um, on the, the economic stuff I think that's especially the case because you see off it's like that's that phrase Tony Ben had which is they can always find money for war but they can't find money to feed kids and essentially that's true and you're seeing it now overnight um, Boris Johnson promised 16.5 billion more uh, of more funds to the UK military Meanwhile, he had to be sh shamed into just allowing kids to have f uh, free school meals during holiday uh, season, which was what, a couple of million quid or, or definitely not much. So it's all about priorities. And if we had the right priorities, we could we could move forward. But our whole political system is built and we'll come onto this now with discussion of the article, which I chose, is built to stop the uh, any kind of figure or any kind of movement that might challenge the system that doesn't allow democracy or doesn't allow uh, a redistribution of wealth and power. 